for it. Amen. Well, this morning, I'm starting a new sermon series called Do the Right Thing, Reclaiming God's Love for Justice. I want to talk about justice because for some strange reason, the word justice has taken on a negative connotation for some Christians, and that concerns me because the Bible says that God loves justice. Let me share three verses with you from the Bible. In Psalms, it says twice, for the Lord is righteous, he loves justice. And then righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. In Psalm 89, and many of us have seen these words from the prophet Micah. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? If God loves justice, if justice is so important to God, being the very foundation upon which his throne sits, then we should love justice too. A few years ago, I looked up every time the word justice was used in the Bible, and there were over 400 references Clearly, it's important to God, and that's why I want to reclaim the word for us as God's people. I'll take more time next week to define justice, but for now, my simple definition is this, putting things right. Justice means we are to do the right thing by putting things back the way they were meant to be, balancing the scales of justice so no one is treated unfairly. That has been God's mission in the world ever since Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, and that should be our mission as well. I want to start today by talking about doing the right thing for women. You know, when I grew up, doctors, lawyers, pilots, politicians, and pastors were all men. Teachers, nurses, stewardesses, and store clerks were women. In other words, women were rarely in roles of authority. And the Bible seemed to back that up, so I accepted the status quo without giving it much thought. The churches I attended had only men in leadership positions. Even the ushers were men. But there were a number of events that caused me to pause and reconsider what was true. And so I dug a little deeper in the Bible. And when I did that, I realized that there was more to the story. So I want to share some of that story with you today to see how we can do the right thing for women. I'm going to walk us through a few verses from the book of Genesis, starting in chapter 1, where God said this, Let us make man in our image in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What I want you to see here is is simply this. There is no judgment assigned to the man or the woman. That is, God showed no favoritism of one over the other. Neither the man nor the woman was shown to be better than the other. Neither had authority over the other. And neither one was given more responsibility than the other. The two of them together reflected the image of God. Listen to what else it says here. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Again, God didn't make a distinction here between the man and the woman. He commissioned them both. He gave them both authority to subdue the earth and then to rule over it. For either the man or the woman to seize control from the other, or for either of them to abdicate their responsibility to the other, would have tipped the scales of justice and distorted the image of God. You see, the image of God was reflected in the perfect balance of them working together in harmony. God created them as co-rulers of God's creation, and he saw that is very good. Now, are you with me so far? I just want to make sure that we we don't bring any cultural bias into our reading of Genesis 1. We tend to do that. I want us to simply read what it says, not what we want it to say or what others have told us it says. Okay, now let's move on to chapter 2. Chapter 2 actually retells the creation story in more detail. In chapter 2, it tells us that man was created first, God created Adam, but he made this observation. He said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Adam was created first, but things were not very good when Adam was all by himself. He was lacking something. The image of God wasn't complete with only Adam, and so God created the woman to resolve the problem. Now, that word helper has caused some problems in how we view women, because when we hear the word helper today, 
We think of a servant, right? Or even a child. A helper in our world today is simply someone who assists the person in charge, but they have no authority on their own, and they aren't seen as someone who has the knowledge to accomplish the job. But that's what the word, but that's not what the word helper means here in this context. In the original Hebrew language, the word helper was actually a powerful word. It didn't mean an assistant or a servant or a novice. It didn't mean a secretary or a gopher, as in go for this and go for that. The word helper literally meant one who enables or empowers another person in need. In fact, the word is often used of God in the Bible as in, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our helper and our shield. Or, I am poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O God. You are my helper and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. So the woman brought to Adam the missing ingredient necessary that created the secret sauce for the image of God. Then it says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So what can we learn from these verses? Why do you think God made Eve from Adam rather than making her from the earth? One thought is that it shows how deeply connected they are to each other. If they were both made from dirt, they would be seen as more independent. But by God creating Eve from Adam, God was showing us how their unity and similarity is a big part of reflecting God's image. And Adam confirmed this when he said this. He said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Adam was telling us that Eve was just like him. He was made from the same stuff. She wasn't some separate entity that he could ignore or look down on or use for his purposes. Eve was just like him. Plus, notice that Eve wasn't taken out of Adam's foot. If she was, you might think that she was inferior to Adam. No, she was, she was his equal and worthy of his full respect. So just two chapters into the Bible, the Bible is consistent and clear that man and woman are created equal. They have been established by God as co-managers or co-rulers of God's creation. They have been given the right to rule the earth. And together, they reflect the image of God by sharing power with each other. But then something happened in chapter 3 that shattered that unity and distorted God's image in the relationship between the man and the woman. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and as a result, as a result life got very hard for them. It's as if they took a baseball bat to a, to a china vase. They shattered the beauty of what God had created in them. And as a result, a curse came upon the earth. The Bible tells us that God cursed the serpent who was responsible for tempting Adam and Eve. He also cursed the ground, making it hard to produce a harvest. It said this, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. The Bible doesn't use the word curse in regard to the woman, but it does say this. God said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will will rule over you. Now that sounds like a curse to me. The perfect balance, the perfect unity that existed before the curse was now gone. The two of them no longer worked together in a way that reflected the image of God. It's important to see that whenever we step away from God, it introduces pride and power struggles in our relationships. One person or one group or one nation will want to dominate the other. And that's why it says here that her husband will rule over her. Suddenly, the man was, was no longer content as his wife's equal. He wanted to dominate her. He wanted to control her. There was no longer a relationship of mutual respect and a shared power. Adam wanted to call the shots. I was talking with a man once about his marriage, and he confessed to me with some shame how easy it was to play the man card, meaning that if he wanted to take control of an argument with his wife, he would typically raise his voice or make some emphatic statement, expecting his wife to fall in line and yield to his demand. End of discussion. And his wife would typically comply. He was embarrassed to tell me that. He wasn't proud of his behavior. And I think his attitude came straight from Genesis 3. 
And it's continued to bleed into our culture ever since. Now, man, I'm not here to beat us up, okay? That's not my intention, so please don't get defensive. But I am here to help us to do the right thing. And if we want to do the right thing, it's important to take a look back at where things went wrong. What I mean is that you can track the injustice that women have endured throughout history by reading what men have said. For example, Socrates said that women are halfway between men and animals. Plato stated that evil people will be reincarnated as women. Aristotle saw women as defective males. These descriptions might sound laughable, like no one could possibly take them seriously, but they did. These philosophers influenced the thinking of all the generations that followed them. And what's really sad is that the church often reinforced these false ideas. In fact, some of the church's leading theologians have supported these ideas. Let me read to you just a few of the quotes from throughout history, church history. Augustine, who was a 4th century theologian, thought another man would have been a better companion for Adam. In his mind, women were only for making babies. To Thomas Aquinas, who was a 12th century theologian, he said that women were defective by nature, not imaging God. Men needed to dominate them because women can't reason well on their own. And Martin Luther, from the 13th century, said, man reflected God's image, but the woman only lesser, similar to the sun and the moon. He also believed that man's dominion was women's punishment for introducing sin into the world. He said this, women are on earth to bear children. If they die in childbirth, it matters not. That is what they are here to do. To say the least, these quotes are shocking, embarrassing, and, and shameful. But all these quotes, but all of these quotes justified in these men's minds why women needed to be dominated. They couldn't be trusted. They're wicked. They're temptresses. They lack the ability to reason. They're, they're just for childbearing. And all these men pointed to Genesis 3 as God's stamp of approval on their thinking. My point here is that these men misinterpreted Genesis 3 and used it to justify not only their low view of women, but their domination over women. And since these men were some of the leading theologians of the church, their negative view of women permeated the church and shaped the church's thinking on, on women for centuries. There are still vestiges of this thinking in the church today. But the truth is that Genesis 3 is not what God wants. The curse of Genesis 3 is the result of or the consequence of sin. You see, the role of the church isn't to enforce the curse. The role of the church is to reverse the curse, to do all we can to restore the image of God to the relationship between men and women. I mean, think about it. Genesis says that work will be hard, but we don't try to make work hard to fulfill Genesis 3, do we? It says that our fields will yield thorns and thistles, but we don't plant thorns and thistles to fulfill the curse of Genesis 3. No, we try to reverse the curse. We are always searching for an easier way to do our work, and our scientists work hard to eliminate weeds in our fields. The same should be said in regard to women. We shouldn't use Genesis 3 to justify dominating women. We should work to bring equity back into all our relationships and in our work environments. This is what justice looks like. God loves when we do this, and Christians should be leading the way. So, men, God is calling us to restore his image by respecting women, including them in the decision-making process and sharing the power at church, in the home, and in the workplace, and making sure that they get paid the same as well. I think it's fair for women to demand equality, but it's a lot nicer if men offer it first. They shouldn't have to ask for it. A man by the name of Don, a Dr. Ron Barger, wrote a small booklet about his awakening to the value of his wife. In it, he confessed how he thought little of women and treated his wife poorly. But then through a string of tragedies, God opened his eyes to her worth and value. And this is what he wrote. He said, frankly, once I started listening to Susan, once I began really hearing her and drawing her out, I was startled at how many and how deep were her wounds and her sorrows. Most were not sorrows unique to Susan. They were the sorrows that all women feel, sorrows that arise from the, the particular physiology of women and from their vocation as mothers, which gives them heavy duties and responsibilities, while leaving them almost totally dependent on men for their material well-being and their spiritual support. Sorrows 
that arise from the fact that in our society, even the most chaste of women are regularly threatened by the lustful stares, remarks, and advances of men. And sorrows that arise because our society in general still considers women stupid, flighty, and superficial, and still places very little value on women and shows very little respect for them. Women suffer these wounds far more often and with a greater intensity than most of us men ever realize. And unless we ask them, women generally do not speak to us of these sorrows, perhaps because we men so often dismiss their troubles as insignificant or write off women themselves as simply weak and whiny. Jesus called us to be a light in the world. And one way we can do that is for men to go out of their way to recognize the value of women and share their position and power with them. You know, Thornapple and within our church denomination worldwide, which is the Evangelical Covenant Church, we're committed to elevating the value of women and making sure their gifts are recognized and put to use. We don't distinguish between the ministry roles of men and women. And here at Thornapple, we work to keep a 50-50 male-female balance on our board of elders, if possible. And even now, as we search for a senior pastor, we are encouraging women to apply for the position. And so as we consider what it means to do the right thing in the coming weeks, I hope we will all purpose to do the right thing for women by reversing the curse of Genesis 3. Let's do our best to show the world the true image of God by how we treat one another. Let's pray. Father, you created us to reflect your image to the world. But of course, Adam and Eve distorted that image and we have perpetuated what they started. Please forgive us for any way that we have contributed to that distortion. And if we are still guilty of it today, give us eyes to see it so that we might change. Might you bring healing to the hearts of women who have felt diminished and disrespected in any way. Might they find their worth not only in Christ, but in how they are treated by others. And we ask that in Jesus' name.